Hello and welcome along to another episode of My Football Story from the Honest Football Podcast. This week, Charlie speaks to Northern Irishman Gerard Little about his brilliant career in the game. We start with a youth career moving across to Celtic in Scotland and being part of a massive club, how that shaped his career. Before some brief stints in England, followed by a return to Northern Ireland and a step from professional to semi-pro football. Gerard's now moved into management and he's very honest about his coaching career including a successful spell in the Northern Irish Premier League, a move south of the border to full-time football, and then of course now where he can be found in a Northern Irish setup, where he's part of the youth structure in a Northern Irish FA. We really hope you enjoy this one. If you do, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more. But this is Gerard Little's football story, and we really hope you enjoy it. I'd like to say that Jared's with me now. Um, Jared, thank you obviously for joining us. I appreciate it. it's a Friday afternoon and there's probably other places to be. So thank you for, for being here with us. No problem at all. It's a pleasure. Um, so obviously, Jared, you had such an a, illustrious sort of career as a player. And, you know, we're going to talk about that in depth, um, where you sort of began and, and, you know, obviously where you are now and, and that journey. But what we would like to do with everyone that we have on here, um, particularly professionals, is, is you're sort of just talk about your first memory of football. So whether it was, you know, in the back garden or your first ever game or first game you watched. So where did that journey of football begin for you, really? Going right back to when I grew up in the in the New Lodge area in Belfast, mm. playing football on the streets, I suppose, with either two lampposts or, or two coats starting as goals and, and away we went. And we probably played morning, noon and night until we were called in either for dinner or for lunch or for, for whatever it was or, or bed times. And, and right through even at school, you know, we were playing in the in the playground, in the schoolyard. And we would have used anything that we could, could have. We didn't have a football, we would have used a... A, a plastic bottle or a can or, or anything so that was the that was the memories growing up you know and when you look back now you know we, we were playing little rondos and, and little 2v1s and 2v2s and 3v2s yeah. so that's all the obviously the coaching craze now mm. in terms of you know what coaches do and we were doing it naturally you know without even thinking and and, and back then it was uh it was last man in nets as well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> here, here was there, you could handle the ball, the last person. So yeah. you, know, you were just constantly thinking and, and, and doing things that sort of became natural to you. And it was, they were the days, you know, they were the, the great days and great memories. And mm. as I say, you know, that that side of football, I think, is, take, is, is, is taken away from us now from mm. kids. You know, it's, you, you very rarely, you know, see kids playing on the street. You yeah. know, they're, they're more in their their playstations and their, mm. their consoles and, and, and uh, rather than playing out and, and having a kick it about with their, with their mates. So yeah. it's, it's sad to see, you know, but say that the street footballers are, are far, a few, far, few and far between now. Mm. Well, you know yourself, obviously you went on to play professionally, but I imagine that was a, a good grounding anyway, wasn't it? You know, like you say, that sort of upbringing in, in that sense. Yeah, it was. And, and you played with all ages, you know, you played mm. with, you know, your your own age, your own mates, or you played with older boys, or you played with, yeah. you know, whoever, whoever was there wanted to play, played, and, and you just made it up as you, you went along, you know, your technique was, was around headers and volleys, you know, and <laughs> again, you know, if you, if you missed the, the volley, or if you had a volley and the keeper caught it, you know, you were in goals, and mm. you tried your best not to, not to be in goals, so, <laughs> you know, it had a great, great memories, and, and uh, say that, that was the start of, of obviously learning, and, and, and playing football naturally. Mm. Do you remember the um, the first game you ever watched? Like, whether it be on TV or going to a ground or? First game I ever watched was probably my dad playing, right. playing for the, a Sunday league team, you know. Yeah. I, I remember back back then, I think it was the World Cup when Maradona was playing. He made it, was it 82 maybe the World Cup? I can't mm. remember. Uh, and, and it was on later. And I remember uh, begging my mum could have stay up to watch it because it was like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock the games were on at night. Yeah. And, so I had to be on my best behaviour throughout the week or throughout the day. And if it didn't, that was I was threatened that I wasn't allowed to watch the football and was put straight to bed. So <laughs> I had to be a good boy the whole, the whole duration of the World Cup or otherwise I wasn't allowed to watch the football. <laughs> That's brilliant, that. Um, and just a question we sort of like to ask you know, professionals is, and you know, not in a disrespectful way, but when you were at school, obviously you went on to play professionally, were you that much better than everyone else? Or do you know what I mean? Because some people have, you know, always head and shoulders above others. And then we yeah. spoke to other people who actually at school were sort of not really, you know, thought of, but then went on to have amazing careers. So what was it like for you? Yeah. Were you sort of that much better? Or So I was always, always classed as the best footballer in the school. Right. Right through my whole primary days from sort of primary five up. And I always played, I always played a year or two up as well, where when I was in primary five, I played for the, the primary seven team. I competed okay with it. You know, it was fairly... Mm. 
in terms of my stature and, and stuff, I, I wasn't small. I was just, you know, I could hold my own basically. And the same way when I went to secondary school, you know, I would have been first year playing for the third years. And uh, again, I would have been playing every game. So, you know, so I think then, you know, it was always classed as the best player. You know, there was always one or two who was competing with you and <laughs> what I sort of said, I think that they're the best players. But, you know, I was the one probably in, in my school that went on and, and had a, an okay career mm. in terms of moving across at 16, going to the professional club and, and staying yeah. there for, for a wee while as well. Yeah, I was going to move on to that. So that's, I think you've nicely led on to that. It was obviously, you know, um, growing up sort of a Celtic fan, then going to be signed for them. How, how does that come about? Because obviously we've spoken to a few lads who played in Northern Ireland and, you know, the journey of going over the water, as they say, you know, it's quite yeah. a, I know it can be, sorry, can be quite an overwhelming one. Sort of, how did it come about and then how did you find it? I mean, I was, I was playing, first of all, I was playing for my club, um, Santos FC, Eugene McGeehan, who's, who's kind of a mentor right through. He was a school teacher and he was a, he was a coach and, and um, he was my manager. And then Santos sadly folded right. and I had to make a decision. At that stage, because I was, I was, I was doing well, there was like the top sort of local youth clubs where, where our youth teams were, were looking at me to say, like Celtic Boys at the time was, was one of the best. Star of the Sea was one of the best. Lucky enough, I decided to go to Star of the Sea. Right. Just before that, my, dad, my dad's local bar, believe it or not, uh, pub, Derek Dugan, God rest him. Uh, yes. Derek Dugan, yeah, yeah. He was a great footballer from Northern Ireland um, and, and played for, for, for many of the teams. But Derek drank in the, in the local bar and he got happened to talk to my dad and, and my dad was telling him about me, me playing and stuff. He mm-hmm. said, look, why don't you go and match him? So at that stage, Derek was sort of scouting for um, Coventry and Wolves. Right. We we played a game. I think it was maybe the last game Santos played, and and we I think we actually got beat like ten one or something. We right. absolutely annihilated. And I'm thinking, oh my, I've, I've just I knew Derek was up watching, and I went, oh, that's me done. Man. I'm never going to get a chance and opportunity. But lucky enough, believe it or not, I actually played well. Get right, and that <laughs> and, although we get stuffed, and uh, he invited us over. He invited me and another boy over um, for for a trial with both both clubs. Coventry was really good at the time. Coventry was a was really big at the time. They were in the top division. Great setup. Uh, really elected. Had family over there. I went for a trial. Didn't get invited back for a second trial. Wolves. Then I went to Wolves again. Played a trial game. Played me out of position. Played me at left back. For some reason, don't know why. And then in the second half, put me in centre midfield. And I done quite well. Scored a goal. But again, they didn't, they didn't invite me back for a second trial. But whilst, whilst um, that was all going on in the background, Celtic were, were showing an interest. And I moved to Star Wars, as I said. Uh, I was playing a couple of different tournaments. It was actually a, a five SA tournament. Um, again, back then, it was really big, you know, in our mm. age. That's a five SA indoor tournament playing. And the scout over over in Belfast, a guy called Martin Shields, who was of Rosario, had liked me and um, contacted Celtic and said, look, I've got a boy over here. He's doing really well. I'd be worth having a look at, get him over in trial. So that happened when I was at Star Sea and, and again, we were playing a tournament in England um, for Star Sea and, and after the tournament, I travelled on up to, uh, to Celtic yeah. for, a, for a week's trial. Got him right back, I think, three or four times before they actually offered me a contract. And, and, and that was it, really. You know, it was, it was, it was great. You know, it was just the, the thought of just going to Celtic alone mm. for a trial was massive for me because of, you know, I've always supported them as a kid. You know, been was going to games. You know, every every other weekend with with my family and friends, and and um and going to cup finals and and to go there and mm-hmm. and and just train and see the first team players at the Sage and the same training pitch was was unbelievable. So to actually go on and get a contract was was, was a big mm-hmm. achievement for me. Is it if, if you don't mind asking a slightly personal question? Is it quite overwhelming? Because obviously, you know, a stature of a club like Celtic is so big, and you know, such a, an institution sort of going over there, you know, those, maybe that first week, is that is it quite an overwhelming experience or was your mentality yeah, just go and attack it? Like, in that no, sense? no, no, it, it, it's very overwhelming, especially from for a young lad from sort of the New Lodge area mm. and, 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 and from a, an area where a large part is a Celtic daft, you know, supporters. Yeah. And like I say, you know, I, I, I would have wanted the supporters buses, you yeah. know, going to watch these guys and, and to walk through the door of, of Celtic Park and, and you know see all the all your heroes like Paul McStay mm-hmm. and, and and Peter Grant and yeah. and Charlie Nicholas at the time and you know players like that it was like I'm actually here you know 
And that week, I was like, I was like a fan. I was well, still am. I was a fan. I, I wasn't even in the mindset of this could be me. You know, I could be playing alongside these. It didn't yeah. even cross my mind. It was just like, oh my, I'm, I'm, I'm at Celtic Park. I'm with my heroes. And you know, we trained at Barrafield, and you know, it was, it was a rude awakening because you're, you were three in. You were, you were constantly doing stuff. You know, you were treated, not treated. You were tested. You were tested in terms of, you know. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And if you didn't, you know, the attitude was, right, I'll be the next boy, I'll come along, I'll do yeah. it. And that, that was it, really. So it was it was very daunting, you know, it was mm. very daunting. And, and that was just a trial, even when I signed, it was, it was still the same. It was very daunting and, you know, it was, um, but it was, it was, it was unreal, you know, it really was. Yeah, if you don't mind me asking, did you did you feel homesick at all? We've, I've spoken to a couple of Irish League players, or sorry, people who, you know, from Northern Ireland who've then gone over. And some have felt homesick, some haven't. You know, what was that like for you? If you don't mind me asking, obviously. Yeah, yeah. No, listen, that's the biggest thing. It's the biggest, mm. it's the biggest hiccup for any young, I suppose, any young Irish players that, that's leaving the comforts of, of their home over here where they get everything handed to them, you know, in terms of their, as we call it, their wee mummies. You know, <laughs> You know, with a with a lift and laid him, and I was the same. I was a mummy's boy, and I got everything done for me. Mm. And you know, looking back then, it was it was eight months before I was actually allowed to come back home. So I was away first time away from home. I was at, I was at uh, Celtic for eight months before I actually get home to visit yeah. the parent again. And it was very tough. It was really really fr- a lot of lonely nights, a lot of lonely mm. days, a lot of. Sometimes, you know, having a little cry to yourself. You got to remember, Charlie, back then we didn't have mobile phones. No, no, of course. Phone box, and you had to walk a mile to get to the phone box with, with a handful of 20 Ps. And, yeah. And, and that was it. And, you know, it was writing letters and, and stuff mm. like that. So there was no Facebook, no social media, no Twitter or anything. So it was very, very tough in terms of communicating. Mm. You know, it, it was it was a test of your character. Absolutely. You know, no doubt about it. And. You know, if you and if you can get over that hurdle, then you're fine. But you know, away from the football, it, it it's made me the person. Celtic made me the person I am today. You know, I I had to grow up quick. I had to become a man quick. And and when I got over that, and matured. You know, it set me up for for life in, in, yeah. in terms of doing whatever I have to do. You know. No, I appreciate being so honest about it. I thank you for that, Jerry. You know, I think that's um that sort of leads nicely onto the next part. Of just just that while you're at Celtic, what's just something I want to sort of touch on because you've obviously lived the dream and played professionally. What is the difference between, say, you know, youth team football and first team football? And what I mean is, obviously, I know that they're probably better players, but is it the physicality? Is it the speed of the game? What, what's the sort of biggest differences? Yeah, the, the difference between youth, youth and, and first team, obviously, is there's no doubt about it, the pace, but it's right. the physicality as well. Mm. You know, I remember training once with the um, getting called up to the train with the first team and like to Pierre Van Hoydonk and uh, De Canio, mm. and Daddy, and, you know, just absolutely... Oh, yeah. There's a man, you know, they're beasts. You have a, a, a little 17 year old from Belfast, there's a little wimp, you know, and, and you're trying to compete. And they're actually, they're, honestly, they're, they're complete men. And I remember, I remember actually, this is no word of a lie. I remember when we started off, you're doing a little circle before, the yeah. walk, before we start training. And we had, uh, I know Meg, Peter Von Hoyduck. And honestly, he came in, there started cheering. So he got embarrassed, obviously, that a, a young player had not made them. He, he then came in the next time and I tried to go through me, absolutely mm-hmm. put me up in the air. And I, I think that set me up. You know, I stood up to him yeah. and the two of us had to be separated. And Paul McStay and Peter Grant actually took my side over him and, and basically said, look, you've, right, that's a young lad, you know, mm. you know take it in the chin, you know, he's put it through your leg, bit of fun, bit of banter, and that was it. But from then, I was, I was... Not lacked it, but you know, they knew that I was a young lad that wasn't gonna I'm not saying be messed about, but I would have stood up for myself and yeah. and that sort of came again from my background of, of growing up in, in North Belfast and mm. being a little bit streetways and you know, having a bit of fate about me, you know. Yeah. Just just on that on a quick side note, really, because I grew up a West Ham fan and obviously De Canio would be one of sort of one of my favourite players growing up. What how good was he? Obviously you played with him in that sense. He's, but... he's the best player, honestly, and I've always said this, he was he was my favourite. He was for any any young player that was able to see him train, was able to see him play, he was so professional. He was frightening. He was absolutely frightening in many ways. For me, he was he was just a complete player. He was an animal on the training pitch. He I remember this way back, and again when you're young, you, you're looking and you're trying to watch, you're trying to learn, you're trying to 
sort of you pick a player and you try and go well that that's exactly how I want to you know learn from and, and do things from and 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 the Kenny will remember having a go at that, that, that stage Simon Donnelly and that were coming through the ranks of, of you know breaking through in the first team and the likes of Simon and that would uh, they were really keen golfers mm. loved the, the golf so they couldn't after every training session they couldn't wait to, to get off the training pitch and go and play golf and I remember the Kenny absolutely hammering him after a training session mm. um, about because they, he could see potential and, and Simon Donnelly you know they were they were really good players and saying look Stay behind, you know. This is your this is your profession. It's your livelihood. Mm. Practice, because he would have he would have stayed behind every session after every session for at least an hour and practice on his mm. own, and done things, free kicks, whatever it was, shooting, and he had stayed. And where these young players were were just a way to go. Yeah, you know, it was it's that that story. You know, the the they work really hard till they get the first team, and then when the first team to get there, mm. they sort of take your foot off the gas. Where they need to work extra harder. Yeah, at later. So that was his mentality and. I remember even in, in testing, you know, we, we would have done physical testing in the gym and uh, the philosophy of your of the legs. I mean, his, his quads were they were, <laughs> they were massive, and he shaved the he shaved the hairs on his legs and all, so he could he could stick out more. You know, he was a mad, mad, mad Italian. You know, yeah. everything you heard him is so so true. You know, he was so boisterous, <laughs> so loud, but boy, he was a player, and mm. and and, and uh, he was so professional and. and Brandy, you had a, an awful lot of time for the young players. You know, he mm. would have went out of his way when you would have helped them, you would have talked to them. Um, you know, he would have had banter with them. He was so classy, his gear, you know, he was just a yeah. typical Italian. He was brilliant for Celtic, you know, and, and obviously for West Ham. And, and, and yeah. That, but, but uh, you know, for me, as I say, he's one of the best players I've seen playing in life. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, you sort of uh, not only have you been a professional, you've worked with him, which is sort of two things I'd love to have done. So I appreciate you uh, obviously yeah, bit, sort of talking about that. But the, um, Back to you anyway, because obviously here to sort of to, to speak about you. How do you view your sort of time at Celtic overall? I mean, obviously, I imagine there have been lots of, you know, is it four years I think you were there roughly? Do you look, look back at it quite fondly or is there any sort of regrets about it at all? If you don't want me asking, obviously. Like. Well, I look back thinking it was the best days of my life. It was it was unbelievable. You know, I met so many great friends who still I'm in contact with. I basically learned the game there, you know, in terms of, you know, being well coached, professionalism. You know how how to conduct yourself on off a pitch. Working with Willie McStay again, he was a, another Celtic great, and I'm still very close to Willie now to this day. He was my manager at the time. It was just it was unbelievable. You know, it was unbelievable. Glasgow's an unbelievable city. It's an unbelievable place to live. And I think you know once you get over that eight months of being homesick, Glasgow people are for me they're they're similar to the Irish people. You know, yeah. they're the same personalities. You know, they're very friendly. They'll help you. They'll go out of their way and. And again, I say I loved it. So the memories, the education behind going to Celtic was was unbelievable. You know, it was mm. it was it was worth you know everything. Regret, regrets was Charlie. Yeah, of course you do. You know, you probably you know you get this stage where I got this stage where I was I was thinking you know, I need to start thinking about first, first team football. And I was playing under twenty one international football at the time. I was sort of just sending yearly contracts at Celtic um, pro contracts and. We we were trying to stop Rangers play start doing ten in a row or nine in a row and um, none of the, none of the youth were getting a chance you know we were playing regular in the reserves and they were sending like the Canio Hoy Dunks you know they're all these superstars to stop by uh, Rangers and I had to make a, a decision it was one of the hardest decisions ever and Jimmy Quinn who was um, assistant manager at Peter at the time was over with the international team and he liked me and he says look would you would you fancy it and I was sort of kind of thinking well. You know you're gonna you're gonna play first team football. Um, mm. this could be the making of you. I spoke to Willie McStay. Willie says, "Look, go down. If you don't like it, the doors always open." And I was like, yeah. "Really?" And that that was unbelievable for such a big mm. club like that. You know, you're still being looked after. I remember even being away and Willie still in contact with me. How are you getting on? Were you are you happy? Are you settled? And da 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 da. And you know, I I went and done it. But again, I always question because when I left, Celtic obviously achieved what they had to achieve. Kenny Douglas and that came in. Mm-hmm. I was obviously friendly with Paul Douglas, uh, his son who shared a room with me for for three years, and and then he he changed everything. The rule changed in terms of the youth getting opportunities to sit right. on the bench. Youth players were getting more of a chance, and I kind of think, well, if I had a still been there, maybe I, mm. you know, could have had that chance and opportunity to play in first team football, and I didn't. But like I say, you know, that's that's the that's a small regret. 
you know, obviously in terms of, you know, moving away and, and other things, but uh, it was it was an unbelievable time. Mm. You know, uh, it'll never leave me the memories I held there. Yeah, no, no, I can only I can imagine, obviously, especially a club like that. You say, um, I was going to go on to it a bit later on, but since you brought it up, we'll sort of talk about it now. Obviously, representing your country under underage levels and and all the way through that. Where where does that rank for you? Because we've I've spoken to a couple of players who represent their country at, at levels, and some of them have said that actually they're probably. Re- achievements for their club higher than what they do playing for their sort of national team and others have obviously said their way around where does that sort of lie for you like representing your country in comparison to yeah, other I, stuff in your career uh, no it, it ranks high you know because i I've, I've i've sort of tried to play every at every my goal and ambition was to play at every level at, at international I, I only got up to under 21 level i mean i always took great pride in playing for for northern ireland and, and playing from a country when when I had the opportunity and, and when I was selected. So it, it was grand, you know, I, I loved getting home. I loved, you know, the time I loved getting home and seeing my family. And it was an opportunity for, for my family who couldn't get over to, to Scotland to watch me play. An opportunity for them to see me playing. And playing against massive nations. You know, we had some really great chips. We had qualifying games. You know, we're playing against Germany and, 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 and teams like that. And it was unbelievable, you know, it was unbelievable. We had a really good group and, you know, I think four or five of, of, of the under 21s, maybe more. Went on the the play for under national like Philip Moran, Paul McRae, Roy Carroll, Damian Johnson. Mm. Um, you know they're all, all great players. But you know it was, it was great. You know and it was great to be able to go and and, and play and, and and be selected. I played right back or played centre mid. I always wanted to say that I was the best under one uh, international player in the country at that level. You know or, or in that position. So you know I, I took great pride in that. And, mm. and as I say, I have great memories. I think. 12, 13 caps for, for the under under 21s, you know, which was, yeah. which was great for me. Do you think you were close to getting a senior cap? If I'm being honest, I don't because I, I wasn't consistent at level, at, at first team level, you know, it wasn't, I went to Peterborough, it was actually, I had a fallout with Barry Fry when I was at Peterborough, I had a, when I signed, I had a really good pre-season. You talk about luck and timing in, in the game and, and unfortunately my timing, my luck wasn't great. Jimmy signed me, he left, I got injured in pre-season after the towards the end coming the season starting, I got injured. So I was playing more under twenty one football than mm. under, you know, pushed me into reserves, pushed me into the own at some stages, you know, just to get me out of the club. And it was it was a difficult time and and it was a it was a challenging time mentally because, you know, you had to be tough and you had to stand up to him and you had to believe that, you know, you were good enough and, mm. and he wasn't picking you whatever for whatever reason, whether it was politics or, or whatever. So these these are part and parcel of, and this is the kind of things that I actually try and talk to our young lads about because mm. every young footballer is going to face it. You know, they're going to yeah. face these challenges. They're going to face being left out of teams and and other managers having different opinions off you. And, and but that doesn't mean you're a bad player. You know, it's no. just an opinion, and that's that's why it's such a, a beautiful game. There's so many different opinions. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. We um, just on a very quick side note, we we sort of have spoken about Barry for a few times for various things on the the podcast and. Obviously, I think there was a famous documentary that we, we sort of spoke about once and you do get an, an impression of Barry Fry. I'm not asking you to pass comments. I don't want you to sort of get in trouble. But it, what you said doesn't surprise me, I suppose, is the politest way to, uh, to put that. Listen, Barry's a football man. He's, he has his ways and his beliefs. And he's, uh, he, I mean, he, he certainly taught me an education and, and <laughs> how to stand up for myself and mm. how to fight back. But, you know, Barry's Barry and that's it. You know, he's, he's a character and... You know, he's, he's, he's been successful in the game, I suppose. So, are you going to argue with that? Yeah, no, 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 fair enough. But we're, uh, we'll carry on with, with you. So, obviously, so my sort of relationship for, for the Irish League is actually from my wife who, you know, she's from Northern Ireland and moved over um, about 10 years ago. But her fa- my father-in-law is a Ballymena fan, which is obviously where you went to next. I've been over quite often to watch, um, you know, every time we come over, I try and catch a game at, at various yeah. places. Obviously, that going back to, to Northern Ireland, that sort of journey over... Just if you're not me asking a slightly personal question, and I only ask this because a couple of people who've come back over the water have sort of, we've asked them, did you feel like because of the level you've been playing at that you would almost walk back into the Irish League with a bit of, not an arrogant way, but did you feel like you were, you know, you'd know you easily just pick up the speed and get on with it because of where you'd been before? Yeah, uh, again, great question because you think automatically that, I suppose a, a lot of players, certainly myself back then, underestimated the Irish League. When I come back, uh, you don't take into consideration, you know, you're going from full-time football to part-time football. So you're going from basically every day training to be a footballer, being your job. You know, how you eat, how you, how you sleep, how you rest up, how you recover, all that type of stuff, to 
get into Irish League football and having to work. Mm. So getting up in the morning, going to work, rushing back from work, not getting a dinner and going straight out to training on Tuesday night or Thursday night because only train back then only train twice a week. Trying to adjust to that. So you're what you're doing is a lot of things. You're losing your fitness, you're losing your sharp. You're not as fit and you're not as sharp. Although you, you, I always try to keep on top of that. The other side too is you're playing against, or you're playing with players basically who aren't as fit and aren't as sharp as players would be in England or in Scotland. And so their their thought process isn't isn't the same so mm. you're seeing things quicker than them and you're trying to you're trying to adapt that and you're trying to get to that 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 forward pass a third man run or, or something like that and boys are like I write that on him I can't I'm not fit enough or you know I know I'm not going to get there or, so adjusting to that was very difficult very difficult and I remember the first season at Balamina going question yourself you know you feel as if I'm not good enough for the Irish League you know, because I'm not playing as well as I should be, and not playing to the capabilities of of of, of where I should be, and and it's down to many things. It's down to say, you know, that stage I ended up. I think I became a uh, a spin instructor at Balamina, and I was doing like five spin classes a day, and then going to train at night, and absolutely exhausted, and, and trying to play a match on a Saturday. Oh, what? It's, it's such a shock to the system, and it probably took a few years to really adjust to that and get used to that again listen as I said uh, I think this league we know for especially young players coming back and any young player coming back you know there is a lot that struggle you know and they're out of the game unfortunately yeah no I think um, you know it's, it's, I'll be honest I'm not just saying this it is my favourite league of football to watch and I'm not just saying that because obviously I sort of watch it fairly often but it's just um, you know it's good, it's good honest football but just going back to you really quickly what why Balamina? Because I'm sure after the background you'd have had, there would have been a lot of suitors who could have, you know, and I mean, it's a, it's a polite way to Balamina, but it's never, it's not like, um, for people who maybe aren't familiar, they're not one of the big Belfast clubs who would always be in and around the league, you know, yeah. might be a good cut run and stuff. So why there or, as opposed to maybe somewhere else, given the background that you've had? I mean, Bal- Balamina is a sleeping giant for me. It always was. And I've, mm-hmm. I've always said this as a player and a manager and a coach, I always said Balamina is a sleeping giant. It's a massive club and it's a well-run club. And I really loved it, and I'd have loved to have stayed there longer. But the, the main reason when I signed for Ball, I mean, it was probably Nigel Best, who was the yeah. manager at the time. Nigel, Nigel uh, was in around the sort of international setups as well. You know, Nigel spoke to me. I knew what Nigel was about. I knew what he liked. I knew how he liked to play. And I, I, spoke, to, I spoke to a few. I spoke to Glenn Torn. I trained with Glenn Torn. I spoke to Clevin at the time. Clevin would probably would have been a more straightforward one for me because of I grew up, you know, uh, supporting mm. them in the minor games. But um, when I went to Balamina, I spoke to Nigel. My good friend, Jerry Flynn, who played for him at the time, obviously, you know, spoke to him as well. And and again, I just I just thought it was right. And unfortunately, that, that season, I think we could relegate it. Mm. Uh, Nigel got the sack and Kenny Shields came in and, and Kenny and I didn't didn't see eye to eye. Yeah. Uh, again, as I say, I, re- I would have loved to have stayed and... and mm settled there for a few years and, and uh, tried to win some stuff but unfortunately they got relegated within the first division they had to make cuts and obviously I was on a good wage at the time and I was one of the ones that had to go and and, and, uh, and that was it so as I say it's probably more down to to Nigel Best Charlie that's why I signed for Ballon I mean, I say they I worked with him before in the, in the underage of international and I knew what type of manager he was. Mm. Yeah, no, no, I think it's, uh, I agree with you, actually. I think, it, you know, there's so much potential there. But actually, like you say, you know, obviously it didn't work out that way for, for, for you of them. But, you know, um, moving on then, eventually, I suppose the next part, bulk of your career would have been at Cliftonville and obviously growing up supporting them. What was that like, obviously, you know, playing for them? But also, would you say that's probably maybe the, maybe the fondest part of your career as a player? Or, you know, where does that sort of rank for you being for playing for Cliftonville amongst the other yeah. players? Yeah. Yeah, Clemwell, Clemwell again was was going through a period where when I signed for them it was under Lawrence Stitt and Mal Donaghy and they were, for me they were a really great one and two you know they really complemented each other Lawrence anyone who knows Lawrence Stitt was a uh, great player in his day hard as nails but had a real dry dry sense of humour Mal was was the funny one and but obviously came with the background of being a an unbelievable player, yeah. you know, for the Man United and then I still think he's 100 caps or so for, for Northern Ireland or 97 caps, he'll tell you. I enjoyed the training again. You know, I was enjoying, enjoying football. He, uh, the sessions were, were brilliant. We, we were playing a nice brand of football at the time, which suited me. And 
we were probably just short of of a, a top striker, you know, if, if, if truth be told, of, of going to that next level in the Irish League. So everything was going well, and Lawrence got the got the sack. I don't know for whatever reason, and Marty Tab came in, and Marty played the complete opposite way of of what Lawrence and and, and Mal did, and you know he went sort of more direct and long, and you know more fight and and. and it didn't really suit me to be honest. So mm. I ended up leaving there and went to the distillery, Lisbon distillery under um, Paul Kirk. Yeah. And that's probably at that stage, that's probably the most I've enjoyed playing in the Irish League on Paul. Again, Paul comes in the background with working in the uh the underages of, of, of Northern Ireland with the international teams and he knew what I was about, knew the type of player I was, and I loved playing for him. You know, I loved playing and that that first season I signed. We we end up we were we were we were going for the league at one stage, challenging right. Linfield, right. and we just sort of dipped off at the last hurdle and, and finished third and qualified for Europe. So it was the first time we qualified for Europe as a club mm-hmm. since uh, Martin O'Neill played for the Stirling right. back. <laughs> you know, so it was a big thing. And and again after that that season, I got a bad injury with my hamstring, and it was just coming back and coming back and coming back. And I end up retiring sort of early, you know, because of it. Yeah, no, I was going to, let's, let's move on sort of nicely onto the next part, really, which was, you know, I was going to ask you actually that transition into sort of coaching, you know, was was that always a long-term sort of um, thing? And and also how, how an injury affected, you know, it's something we've spoken about on our podcast, because although, you know, I've never played the same level as you, you know, just grassroots sort of football, but I did an, I had an injury and I can't sort of play now. And it really affected my mental health, even as a hobby, it affected me, you know, quite badly. And if I'm honest, I'd sort of be intrigued, somebody's played at the elite level then, does it have a negative effect when you're pulled out because of injury rather through, than through choice almost? Yeah, it definitely does. There's no doubt. Um, suppose back even then, you know, you never really heard the word mental health. You know, it wasn't mm. really a word commonly used. You know, even back to Celtic and nobody really, you had to be, you had to be mentally strong, you know, mm. but because no one ever spoke about suicide or, or mental issues or mental problems or, or anything like that. You know, now, as a matter of fact, actually, the first time I came across a, a, a sports psychologist was at, at, at Lisburn Distillery. Right. And again, Paul Kirk was the manager and he was always a forward thinking manager, you know, he always mm-hmm. a step ahead. And he brought in a, a sports psychologist. And I, I remember this guy coming in, Mark Elliott, they still keep in contact with him. Sports psychologist, absolutely fantastic. You know, he get into our heads, yeah. had his visualize and all that, you know. So it was right up my street in, in terms of professionalism, thinking about the game, you know, and that's, that, you know, how you played, what you've done all that and it was it was class and that second season to say when I got injured I got to a stage where I, I know there was whispers behind my back not with the manager but at board level because I was being paid and I was I was playing one week being injured like for the next two three weeks mm-hmm. and and there was question marks from from board level asking you know is he faking injuries is he and anyone knows me that's that's yeah. been, never happened because I love to get I love training you know mm-hmm. always I was Fit, a fit lad and I always done extra training and that was destroying me mentally because mm-hmm. I didn't want people thinking he's here picking up a wage he's going through the motions he doesn't want to play football yeah. it's the total opposite and when you're not playing when you're training all week or you see your mates training all week and you, you're not part of that squad on Saturday you're, there's no worse feeling on that and, yeah. you know, so, um, I got at that stage Charlie where I had to I had to, I had to sort of be honest and say well I can't give you what you're looking you know I can't I don't know. I'm, I'm getting back one week. Nobody, no one could find out. I went to specialist about my hamstring. I paid, paid my own way to yeah. try and see why I kept breaking down with a hamstring injury. And, and I could never get the answer to it. And I think now there's, there's more physio, there's more experts about in, in the game that probably could help you now. But back then there wasn't. You, know, mm-hmm. you, you went to our physio, proper physio at the study. Right. He was a kit man, but give you a rubber, <laughs> give, looked at your hamstring and put the water, spread, spread the can over you and say, ah, you're all right. And that, that's how you were getting treated back then. So it was kind of frustrating. And, and uh, as I say, as you say, the mental, the mental side of it was, was tough because of people thinking that they, you were you were bluffing, which which mm. never been for me, you know. No, 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 of course. And then obviously you, um, on, a, on a sort of more positive side of that, you, you know, you're now a pro licensed coach. You got that, you know, six, seven years ago. Um, Going into that transition, from being a player to a coach, how did you find that? And again, I'm only on about grassroots level, but I've done a bit of coaching with teams since I stopped playing. And I've never got the same buzz from coaching as what I would have done even playing at grassroots football. You know, 
is that the same? I know maybe it's different because you're working at the, the higher, you know, top level of the game. But does do you still get that same buzz from the coaching side or not really? It, it's a different buzz. It's a mm. different buzz. It's obviously you'll never you'll never replace the the plan, you know, from yeah. from you know, that that same that same buzz. The buzz the buzz of coaching or imagine, ma- managing is is obviously winning. You know, we all like to win, and yeah. that winning and, and that desire to win is is unbelievable. And if you're preparing your team, excuse me, at club level or even now at international level, and you're preparing for for a tournament or for a game or for whatever, and um, you win, you know, it's it's a great feeling yeah. because. You know, you're part of that preparation. You're part of 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 doing absolutely everything leading up to the boys training on the pitch, the lead into the games. Exactly. So, listen, no, the the buzz, the buzz isn't isn't the same as playing, but as I say, it's a completely different buzz. And yeah. the, as a manager, when you're winning, it's brilliant. You know, yeah. And obviously, you know, you have to also be ready for the other side of it when you're losing. You know, and and how yeah. you how you relate to that and and control yourself. Yeah, I think it's interesting because the bit that I actually missed the most, even in some ways, was not the playing, but you know, maybe the. I suppose when you go become a, a coach or a manager, you you go the other side of the fence a little bit. And you don't necessarily have the same relationship with players as what you would have done when you were playing. I suppose even that 10, 15 minutes before you go out to warm up or something, you know, that I always used to love that part. It's one of my favourite parts of the day. But I suppose you don't always necessarily get that as a, as a manager. You have to try and be sensible, don't you, as a manager? Or a yeah. coach. <laughs> You know the the focus obviously from the players on on you, and you have to sort of carry yourself better than mm. what you did as a player. Obviously, when I was a player, I was a bit of a messer and a joker, and <laughs> you know. But but when I came to training, I I it was two hours of just you know it's focus and, and yeah. training, and I try and carry that message on to our players now. You know, it's as soon as you put them boots on, as soon as you get the kid on the go and train, that's that's it. You know, it's mm. it's ready. You're ready. Afterwards, we'll have a joke, we'll have a laugh, and. And that, that's the type of manager I would try and be and coach I'd try and be. I'd try and, you know, I'm serious at the right times and, yeah. and obviously I like to be relaxed around the players afterwards. I like them to feel comfortable and, and, and all the rest of it. So, you know, that 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 that's just obviously me going off the back of managers I've worked with. You know, there's, there's, I've worked with lots of managers and I've seen lots of managers good and bad and, and I try and sort of take me bits here and there from them, you know, mm. and, and, and be my own person. So obviously, I mean, you mentioned about being a manager and I'm right in thinking you initially went to Cliftonville as part of the sort of coaching setup and then ended up taking over as manager, you know, and successful with that. But that first sort of, like we almost mentioned as a player, that first week as then a manager, how did, did you feel ready for that? Or was it a bit overwhelming, obviously, because I suppose you were sort of thrust in there almost in a, to a degree. Oh, I, I was ready. I was, I was ready. I, I, again, you know, my journey of being a manager for me was mapped out in, in my head. Mm. Where I wanted to start, where I wanted to go, and 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 how patient I was to get there, and and, and when the opportunity came up to to take over as manager at Clinton was, was unbelievable. You know, it was it was a it was a opportunity I would never was never going to knock back or or never say I wasn't ready. And was one I'm one of them guys that I'm not fearful of you know the job ahead. I'll I'll go in and if I have to learn on the way, I'll learn on the way. Mm-hmm. And Clinton was that you know it was. I was taking over. It was a big task because I was taking over a club, a team that was so successful and doing back-to-back doubles under Tommy Breslin. You know, no matter what I, what I had done or what I was going to do or achieve, it was never going to be good enough no. because of 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 how Tommy was saved to be. You know, he was he was yeah. he's, he's a, he was a legend. You know, he, obviously we all know that. But I learned so much from him, and, and I was part of that. You know, that success. So. I had to then go from we were a free flowing football team. We had players like Liam Boyce and Joe Gormley yeah. and and type of players who were just unbelievable. You know, there it, it's probably a, a thing where you there were you just didn't need to coach them. You know, yeah. you just let them go. Where we didn't have that when I took over, so we were going through like a, a transitional period where um, we had to find a different way of winning because we didn't we didn't have the goal scoring free flowing goal scoring of of them boys. So I had to adjust everything and, and be hard to beat. We were getting. I think when Tommy left, we got beat 6-1 or something by Balamina, funny enough. Right. Um, and that was his last game. I took over after that. So after that, we went from conceding so many goals to, to not conceding. So I just yeah. tightened everything up at the back. I went with a different system. We played one up top. And a game we were very hard to beat. And the first game I think we had was against Glen Torn. We were flying. And we beat them 1-0. So that set me up brilliantly. Uh, I think I ended up going on... 12, 14 game on beating none at that stage and done really well. So 
I was basically told by the the chairman to listen, go in, see how you get on, and then we'll we'll take it from there. You know, if you do well, we'll give you the job. Yeah, and it was like a it was like a an interview basically every week. You know, <laughs> seeing how you done, <laughs> and and I done well, and and I was offered the job. You know, and that that was it. So yeah, um, again, I never signed. It was strange because I never ever signed a contract with Clevenwell. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, never signed a contract, and um. I, I was uh, I was just given the job and that was it. Yeah, I've got to say I've, on a quick side, I've, I've only been to Cliftonville Solitude the once, but it's a brilliant place to uh, to watch football. Sort of having most of the crowd at either end of the ground is probably slightly alien to to a lot of people, but actually, I, you know, I loved it there. But um, obviously, you mentioned that you know how successful you were there, and I, I think you won the League Cup as well along the way while you were there, didn't you? Yeah, first, first season was was great. Uh, again, it was it was tough. Don't get me wrong, it was tough because we we ended up winning the League Cup, yeah. And then we we got to we had to play a playoff final um, for a European spot, mm. and again we we played against Glen Torn, who we were going for at the time as well. We beat them in uh, in the final uh, to get the Euro the Europe. So first season was great. We got the Europe, and then we we ended up winning Europe for the first time mm. I think in the history. I think I maybe got a bad in the history before, but it was the first time I obviously won in a game. Uh, we we went to Defford Dance and, and drew one each. And then took them here and beat them three right. one. Um, and then we played Larnaca in the second round. We were in Dreamland. We we done our homework brilliantly. We thought, Geez, what's going on here? Larnaca, big club like that from Cyprus. We were beating them. I think we were beating them two two one two nil. Sorry, two nil at, at Solitude with fifteen minutes to go. Like Jesus, this is this is unreal, you know. <laughs> right, and then within five minutes, we were three two down. Oh. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. So we went went out to Larnaca, but we're still in, in the tie, and we had a couple of great chances out there early doors to, to go one up, and then we got a player sent off first five minutes oh. and like back against the wall. So went to Larnaca and got beat two 0 out there in the in the heat. Mm. But again, listen, the boys were burning, we were well prepared, and it was a great experience for me as a young manager to, mm. to be able to manage a team in, in Europe, not only you know in the one game, but over two legs, and then obviously in the second round. So we were so so close to. To, to, to getting something from that game but as I said it stood me in good stead for, for me as I'm a young manager to go on and, and batter myself and, and obviously it was great from the CV as well Yeah so I mean obviously that you know great times with, with Cliftonville but then you got uh, eventually you end up at, at Sligo Rovers obviously in, in as, as you would say the south um, for the want of a better phrase Obviously, the, I suppose the, the, the temptation of full time was that an easy choice for you to make or quite a tough one to leave Cliftonville to go there? Yeah it was very tough Charlie if I'm being honest for me, I was trying to build a team at Clevenwell to go and, and win the league again. We were playing probably the best best football in the league, a brand of football. You know, we were absolutely battering teams every week, but just couldn't finish them off. Mm. Uh, we were missing that prolific goal scorer. Uh, what I had done is I had actually signed Joe Gormley when I was manager, yeah. and uh, I couldn't I couldn't play him because it was the, the two club rule. So I had to wait till the season was over before he could play. So I mean, if if we had had him in at the end, we we were flying because we it, said we, we just couldn't. We we're winning one nils and and you know absolutely annihilating teams, but just couldn't couldn't get mm. over the line with them. I I also needed a probably a goalkeeper and a good centre half, so it was I was building. So then Sligo came came along and obviously showed an interest in, in me going down south to the money jam, and suppose I was a little I was a little green in terms of. Sligo being who Sligo were. I mean, Sligo for me are a massive club also, like Cliftonville, and, and have great history. But I probably didn't do my homework quite as much as what I should have in terms of where they were and what they had at, at, that, at that stage. So, But anyone that knew me, including the chairman, knew I was ambitious and knew that you know I always had ambition of being a full-time manager. And when I, when I came along, again, it was a difficult decision. It was a hard discussion I had with the, with the chairman at the time. At that stage, Charlie, we were going through a little period where we weren't winning as well. Mm. So there were sort of question marks even over my future at Cliftonville. And if I'm being honest, I never really got the feeling from the board that they were going to 100% back me yeah. up until Sligo came in. You know, and then it was, it was a different conversation. So I said, you know what, I might never get this opportunity again of, of managing full time and I'll go and have a go. They were, they were bottom of the league. The short term goal was to keep them up and, and not let them get relegated and you know for first season there I, I done that on the last day of the season um, there were three teams going down that, that particular season so it was quite difficult 
and, and as I say, we end up staying up by four points last game of the season. And uh, and then I was hoping to build and I was hoping to, you know, learn from, from the, the season before and potentially get a better budget to, to bring in yeah. bigger players. But that never happened. No. I was promised a lot of things that didn't didn't materialise. You know, I, I produced a lot of great young players who are still playing now. Mm -hmm. I was giving debuts to 17 and 18 year olds at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, John Mahan in particular um, is 60 odd games under his belt at Sligo at the minute, who's who's only 19. You know, wow. so so that's that that's what I was working with, you know, and, and say the, the whole setup wasn't what I expected. You know, there was there was a lot of things that wasn't good and I had to work really hard at and I was kinda of one man ban as well, you know. So yeah. but again I, I take a positive from it. You know, I learned an awful lot uh, as a young manager. It's gonna stand me in good stead going forward, yeah, you, know, you know, when I get back into managing again. Yeah, just um just sort of one last question on that really there. What, aside from the full time and part time element, what what's the biggest difference between the two leagues in terms of the football? Well, the full the full time obviously the difference is the full time. If I'm being honest, you know when I, I remember going to Slag on the first day, my first training session, and I couldn't believe it because I'm thinking I'm going to this club, this massive club who've who won leagues and Satanta cups and played in Europe as well. And like at Clevenwell, we had everything. You know, I I again I tried to have a mindset of a full time mindset at Clevenwell. Yeah. It changed a lot of things. It changed a lot of the, the training, added extra nights on the training. Equipment was, for example, small thing. Um, we had everything. We had mannequins. We had small goals. We had all the best equipment. And I remember going to Sligo for taking my first training session and thinking, I'm walking down to whatever I need is there. Yeah. And when I got down, I looked around. I went, where's, where's the mannequins? Where's the small goals? Where's right. the... And there was nothing. There was, there was a bag of balls. Set of cones and a and a bag of bibs, and and that was it. And I'm I'm like, oh my god, what's going on here? You know, this is this is a club that should you know you people should be able to get your hands on anything. Mm -hmm. So I had to I had to reorder everything. I had to restructure everything. I had to had to go through that whole process. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time watching youth team games as well. The the look, and I know previous managers didn't. And 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 suppose managers will tell you not to focus on the first team because. It's the first team, obviously, yeah. is your concern. But I done all that, done it right, and and again, in my opinion, it was it was it was shafted slightly in the end. And mm -hmm. but again, you you learn from it, and, and and that's it. But the the main thing would be the full time environment in terms of training every day. But you know, Cliftonville was as every bit as good as that. You know, we mm -hmm. we trained hard, we prepared right. You know, we done pre match meals like like full time football. We done video analysis. We done all that type of stuff, and. And that's kind of the, the, the sort of difference between part-time and full-time. No, I appreciate that. No, thank you for, as I say, for the sort of honesty regarding that. We'll sort of get to where you are now, Jared. So obviously you're working with the, the national team in terms of the um, under-16s. Just a, a sort of question, because I suppose you've been asked lots of questions about that, but something I want to sort of delve into a little bit. What's the biggest difference then between coaching, obviously, adults, and you've been working at that level, and then suddenly then having to go almost the opposite direction with, with youth players? Or, or is there a difference? I'm sort of assuming there is, but is there really? In what yeah, way yeah, there's, there's a massive difference. And, and, and if I'm being honest, I, I didn't think I would, I would go into, you know, managing and coaching youth again. Mm. You know, I enjoy the senior, senior side of football at senior level. Uh, the big difference, Charlie, would be obviously your, your language. And, and and I don't mean bad language or, or anything like that. I just mean your language and how you conduct yourself, how you get your message across, mm. how you coach. You know, it's completely different to to talking and coaching a, a senior player. You know, you sort of have to drop the tone a little bit. At youth level, you can you can really go into great depth and, and, and break everything down. And, mm. and, and as we say, peel the onion back and, and keep peeling it back until it's straight. Where at senior level, you know, senior footballers have this tendency to think they know yeah. better than you or they know more than you or, or they know it all and, and they have all the answers, which they don't. So in terms of the coaching side, you can you can really get in, in depth to it. You can really get into, you can really stop it. You can really go through things mm. of how you want to want to do. And and suppose as well, you can you can probably afford to make more mistakes right. as a coach and a manager at, at youth level and certainly at this level at international. Whereas if you're if you're doing the game at a, a senior level, you're making the mistakes or you're you're sacked right away. You know yeah. you're not getting time to, to go and, and cement what you want to do. So that's the big difference for me. You know, mm -hmm. is say is your language in terms of how you 
how you uh, talk to the boys, how you how you put your shy and on, and, and and how you can really go in depth and coach with with young lads more than than the senior players. Yeah, no, I've got to say, Jared, I really appreciate your honesty over all of these questions, and especially that you know because obviously it's I imagine it's you know playing for your country and then getting to sort of coach for that. You know, I think it's a, it's a great symmetry about it. But um, would you get, I know you've probably been asked these before, but just going to finish off with just some, some quick fire ones. So yeah. um, what's your favourite ground you've ever played at? Favourite ground? Probably White Hart Lane. Oh, okay. Right. Very good. Made like that though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, uh, the, old, the old White Hart Lane was, yeah. was unbelievable. Well, I've played a great ground. I played at Hamden, obviously Celtic mm. Park, Ibrox, you know, all great, great, great stadiums. I remember playing a reserve game at uh, at White Hart Lane, and I just thought, oh my, it was like a, a Lego stadium. You know, it was just it was just like it was just built there, and it was on top of you, and uh, the the surface was like carpet. It was mm. it was frightening, but probably I would say White Hart Lane, yeah. And the the best player you've played with or against, actually, either one. Again, I've played with the Canyon, and I played against them. I've actually team the fame. Uh, I've shown. Jim and Jelton, who's a good friend of mine, he, he's, yeah. probably, he's my boss as well. He was up last week and we we're having drinks and I have a bottle of champagne it's still to this day in my, in my cupboard. I was playing for Peter in a pre-season game against Sheffield right. Wednesday and I was marking the Canio. It was the same year he left, same year I left. I was marking the Canio and I got money a match against him. <laughs> it was like the best thing ever because he was one of my, my all-time heroes. Yeah. And I didn't realise Jim was actually playing in the same game for Sheffield Wednesday right. at the time. He says he scored, but I can't remember. <laughs> um, so, probably him or David Janola. Oh, wow. Spurs as well in a preseason game. And that man was an absolute monster. <laughs> was, honestly, he must be about seven foot tall and built like a, a brick. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was huge. Uh, unbelievable. So probably probably hard one between them two. And then the last question, so this series used to be called My Favourite Game. We sort of changed it since we started interviewing pros and that, like yourself. But um, that was the original sort of thing. But we still like to ask the question at the end. But obviously, because you're, you're a player as well, step, tell us what your favourite ever game was as a player, but then also one that you've watched. Probably, probably my favourite game as a player, for the right and wrong reasons, was I remember playing for Celtic uh, Reserves against uh, Rangers Reserves right. at Ibrox. And it was, the, uh, it was the weekend that there was no Premier there was no... Uh, premiership games yeah. so it was only championship and below I think and Rangers again at that stage were were banned big they were banned Albert they were banned all the top 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 stars um, Catuso all them type of players and we had a reserve game so they used all these guys to get the minutes Yeah. and we were such a young team where our oldest player was 19 at the time and we were playing them in Ibrox so obviously these new players were on show Big crowd was going to appear, right. and it, it happened to be thirty-seven and a half thousand. <laughs> watching, <laughs> unbelievable! Like watching a reserve game, um, mm-hmm. and it was the biggest. It was the biggest attendance that weekend right. in Britain. It was a reserve game, Celtic Rangers. Look at that, it's unbelievable. And so I played in that. And it was Catuso's first game, and I, of course, was marking Catuso, who never stopped running the whole game. Right. He was an absolute machine, and I lasted, I think, twenty-six minutes. Got sent off. And that was oh, no. fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there was good things, there was bad things. Obviously, playing in front of that such a big crowd, playing against top players, and then obviously getting yeah. sent off the negative. So yeah, so that watching games, uh, geez, I don't know, there've been that many. <laughs> it was probably Celtic winning a winning a, a cup final. Mm. You know, the cup final games are winning the leagues. You know, it was it was great watching that. You know, as as a supporter. That's that's amazing. And, uh, two cracking games to sort of finish on. You know, I think it's um, particularly that obviously playing in that that uh, yeah. sort of Glasgow derby. But um, Jared, I can't thank you enough for giving up your time. I really appreciate it. It's been absolutely fantastic and loved every minute of this. Um, it just leaves me to say thank you very much, and I really appreciate you giving up your time. No problem. Enjoyment, time. Brilliant, Charlie. Thanks a million. Mm-hmm.